Welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, a show about weirdos, with your hosts, John Fahey, Aaron Peter, and Matt Brousseau. Hello folks, welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, it's a show about weirdos, doggone it. My name is John Boy, I'm your host, John Francis Fahey, joining me as ever is, of course... In light of the Academy Awards ceremony, we have to say the be all end all Ken doll. And I'm enough. You're enough, man. And I'm great at doing stuff. And you're great <laughs> at doing stuff. And my name is Ken, and so are you. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And so are you. Oh. Yeah. We're all Ken. There's a little Ken in all of us. You know what I'm saying? I like to call uh-huh. this guy Manuel Focus. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> DP of the year. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Director of photography. Uh-huh. Yep. Well, Manuel Focus. Focus. Yes. Oh, the, also, autofocus is another one. Mm, auto. Yeah. Autofocus. Oh, okay, yeah. German. <laughs> Gentlemen, how are you? Good. Pretty good. How are you? Very, very good. Um, we have to spend a very uh, special shout out to our friend Taylor Plen having a birthday today. Hey, hey. Uh, you'll hear him occasionally on the Patreon. Of course, we do an extra episode per week for $5 a month over there. That's crazy. Hey, come on, guys. I, but, but you spend that on your latte every morning. I know. Um, well, they got the egg cream last week. They did. They got that publicly. Um, I'm over here wearing my iced tea tea. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to. Uh, I got to share some some recent iced tea stuff on the the Patreon. I think, as well as I really got to go over this uh, Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie. I think yeah. it's it's prime, primo. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Patreon uh, uh, media content. Yeah, it's. Um... Famously bad and never released, right? Also, like, just the documentary about it is fucking amazing because, like, you find out all this shit about, like, I, I guess I kind of love, like, a box office bomb, the story of because sure. people blame each other and stuff, yeah. you know right, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you hear all the all the things that went wrong. Yeah, the hand-wringing, you know? Yeah. A lot of hand-wringing. Finger-pointing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Remember when they used to uh, not release a movie because it was bad? Yeah. Oh, and now they just rele- don't release movies because... They want a tax write off yeah, or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this was this was just done to be like a bargaining chip, um, but it's 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 sweet because like the actors like really got invested in being the characters, and but at the same time you kind of are like, oh my god, they're delusional to think that this terrible movie would be good. Yeah, you know, it's very funny. Um, it's gotta be rough for everybody making it because yeah. they all know it's bad. Oh god, the costumes are so bad. I mean, Doctor Doom still kind of looks cool. Yeah, that guy's really into playing him. I really think you're gonna like hearing from that guy. Nice. Uh, he's really proud of being the first Doctor Doom. You know, only one and he kind of looks the fucking part, man. Without the mask. Yeah, he looks good. He's all fucked up. Yeah, he's one of those. No, he's, he's a big no. Nazi scar. Is that- no. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Mm. No, although they did say that they modeled like his body language off Mussolini, uh-huh. like dude, like crossing your arms after mm. you say stuff and shit like that, and kind that's of that's very very Doctor Doom. It's yeah. very it's yeah. very Makes clever. Sense. Yeah. So it's like there's like you just see these glimmers of them yeah. hoping they can make a good movie, and they can't. They're doing it in a studio where like they told them to tear it down because it's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> like it was, there's no monitors. They just have like a fucking camera you look through. Like it was oh, just like the viewfinder. Yeah, like it was just bad. Amazing. Bad. Yeah, that's great. Anyway, that's the kind of bullshit we talk about over on Patreon. Um, today, uh, the the by the way, the the uh, Fantastic Four uh, documentary was recommended to me by our friend Laura Crawford, who did the research for this profile today. Oh, she's sick. And she also suggested this this, uh, this tidy little subject. Okay. So she's really she's really doing a number on the show. Yeah, Ellis. she's it's, carrying a look, quite a look. It's, it's, it's a nice time. Thanks, Laura. Um, today we are going to talk about Jonathan Wild and Jack Shepard. John Wild and Jack Shepard. Yes. Mm. Not Look. Jack Shepard from the television show Lost. I don't think so. He's a no. fictional character. Yeah, Dude. probably not about him then. A little ditty about uh, John yeah. Jack. Fine. Uh, and uh, uh, she, did she, you said she recommended this one? She did recommend okay. it. Okay. Um, but I do, I, I really love the story, and um, it's a fun area to dig around in because, you know, so much of uh, what we do on the show is like, you know, you go, we're like, how did we ever make it as a species, man? I mean, <laughs> God damn it. Like, really, these people are fucking up big time. Yeah. Um. I saw Oppenheimer. Yeah. Uh, but that's the thing. is like usually we go back, you know, to the 80s and we're like, oh, my God, the, 
the shoulder pads or yeah. you know what I mean? The fashion. But, yeah. when, but when you go far, far back, you're like, what a true gallery of horrors. Existence. Yeah. Everyday yeah. life. Yeah. Um, so this is what we would consider the height of civilization um, at the time because it was the most recent time. Uh-huh. <laughs> Still very bad. Okay. Um, in London, from about 1680 to 1730... Okay. Now you could argue that's still the height of London. Um, well, <laughs> check out how the height of London was. <laughs> London was hit by a massive crime wave brought about by various social, economic, and political factors. The population was surging, and free market capitalism was fairly new. They're kind of moving from this, right. you know, surf type society. Capitalism. Mm. Um, not everybody had figured out how to make it work for them in a legitimate way. In the early 1700s, one in five women in London worked in the sex industry. Oh. Well, they probably, that was the only job they could get, I imagine, right? I like those odds. You know what I mean? <laughs> For what? For opportunity. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes me more sense. <laughs> For job creation? Ah. Uh, Hi. Ooh. Um, throughout that era, England fought wars in Europe, India, and Southeast Asia. There were always tons of enlisted men hanging around London's taverns looking for action and carrying weapons. A nationwide gin craze was also popping off from about 1688 to 1750. Have you heard of this new stuff called gin? Wow, I just pour it down my face. It's oh. fucking fantastic. When the Dutch-born William of, Orange, uh, William of Orange came to the English throne in 1688, gin became the new in drink. Gin could be made with lower quality grain. That's something like, uh, then something like beer, for instance. So gin production allowed the large landowners in Parliament to squeeze more profit out of their substandard grains. Aw. You got some, some real rot gut going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's gin. It's <sighs> French brandy used to be very popular and fashionable, but after many years of war with France, mm -hmm. imported brandy looked unpatriotic. It was also taxed more and tougher to get a hold Freedom of. Freedom brandy. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. They wanted, yeah. France had a chokehold on the international spirits market, and England's parliament was determined to break that hold. Laws were passed to encourage domestic liquor production. At the same time, food prices were dropping, so working people had more money to spend on booze. Oh, great. By 1730, London had around 7,000 licensed gin shops in operation, with countless more underground. <laughs> um, it seems like a lot for... I mean, how many people lived in London at that time? That seems... One in five women were worked in the sex industry and... And it, everybody was brewing gin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And two in five men were making gin. Yeah, um, I believe... Uh, I've seen reports of the population being up to 700,000 at this time. Um, I don't know if that correlates with 50,000 times five. I don't know. 500,000 to 700,000 is apparently what we're looking at population-wise in London. Um, the average English adult was drinking up to 14 gallons of gin annually. Uh, cool. It quieted <laughs> hunger pangs. It offered some relief from the cold uh -huh. and was an escape from life's drudgery. Yeah. Well, that's what the advertisements for gin said. Yeah. <laughs> Don't like life? <laughs> Try gin! <it. laughs> the doctor you says gin. You rub a lamp and it comes out. English gin was stronger than many other alcoholic drinks, around 55% ABV. <laughs> and that's per volume. <laughs> that's, so. that's 110 proof. It was also commonly adulterated with impurities. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Turpentine spirit and no. sulfuric acid were added to the cut the mixture and mimic the flavor of juniper berries. Right, which is what... Gin is supposed to be made. Right, and except for the good stuff. Which As with American Moonshine, there were many tales of blindness ah. among those who frequented the gin shops. Bless you, Angel. Thank you. Just drink some gin. Uh, many gin sellers had a sign hanging by the door that said, quote, Drunk for a penny. Dead drunk for two pennies. Clean straw for nothing. Just fucking get in there and take a snooze, baby. Oh, oh you mean clean straw is in place to sleep. Well, yeah, yeah. You're Jesus. dead drunk. Can't fucking go anywhere. You could be dead for three yeah. pennies. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, meaning that spending a few pennies on gin would get you so drunk you'd be ready to pass out on a bed of straw, of course. Mm -hmm. Writers of the age mentioned the widespread addiction, violence, and social devastation that came from this gin craze. Gin became known as the mother's ruin because of how many drunk women neglected their children and turned to crime or sex work. Oh, my God. <laughs> Some women lost their minds and others ended up in the workhouse, prison, or dead. Gin was to blame for rising crime, general misery. <laughs> general misery. <laughs> yeah, we got this general misery going on. General here. misery. <laughs> Reporting for duty. And, and the, I've got the gin. His popularity was that it, it was strong and cheaper than anything else. Yeah. Wow. And they just didn't want to get cleaner spirits to fuck with France. Right. 
but they also ruined their people as a result. Yeah. But also the guys in the House of Lords are getting, you know, fat coffers, as mm-hmm. you know, as they say. Take that, France. Yeah. Um it was to blame for rising crime, general misery, failing falling birth rates, and rising death rates. The Vice Chamberlain Lord Hervey proclaimed, quote, Drunkenness of the common people was universal. The whole town of London swarmed with drunken people from morning till night. The city streets were also totally dark at night. Public street lighting systems with gas weren't widely available until the mid-1800s. Mm. If you wanted to commit a crime under the cover of darkness, you'd have an easy time going about it. Plus, with all these drunk people just passed out or, yeah. you know, you could ask someone for directions and then they would spin in a circle, fall over. Now, Take the wallet. Yeah. Uh, the Dutch first came up with a police organization in 1581. Scotland created a police force in 1611. Before okay. the UK. And France started using the police system in 1666. I think um, they said around this time their police force was something of an extension of the French military. Uh-huh. And that was another reason why uh, Britain turned their nose up at it and said, nah, we're just going to take care of ourselves. Hmm. In England, law enforcement was bare bones and basically the same from the Middle Ages through the early 19th century. A permanent police force like we're used to just did not exist. The original idea was that every subject of the crown had a responsibility when it came to maintaining law and order. Like neighborhood watch shit, you know? Uh, Anarchy. <laughs> Gin. During the campaigns of Alfred the Great in the ninth century, England accepted a posse comitatus, or power of the guard, yeah. shorted to the posse. This is where a sheriff mobilizes a group of men or posse to suppress lawlessness and defend people, property, and public welfare, but there always had to be a lawful reason for the posse to be called up. In eighteen, in eleven, the posse is a legal term. Yeah, yeah, it's Latin. Yeah, yeah, uh, posse comitatus, baby. Yeah, Latin for a good time. I mean, the posse is getting together. Yeah, but it's Latin. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not as cool when you find out it's Latin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But at least they're all drunk. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> in in eleven eighty one, King Henry the second made an assize assize uh, of arms a s s i z e. Uh, which required that all the free men of England own and bear arms in service to the king and the realm. Some each, sort of law. Each man was required to have particular weapons according to his rank and his wealth. Oh, cool. Think about the- Bow staff, sign, yeah. nunchucks, mm-hmm. yeah. sword. Yeah. yeah, well, if you're a knight, you know, it's because you're rich. Yeah. So this is like the U.S.'s idea of a well-maintained militia. Um, in 1233, an ordinance was passed requiring men to be appointed to the role of watchmen for London, an ordinance in 1252 appointed constables to summon men to arms and deliver criminals to the sheriff. Parliament passed the Statute of Winchester in 1285, which set the standard for policing in England through the 19th century. One very uh, important part of this statute was the requirement to raise hue and cry. In English common law, hue and cry is a process by which the victim of a crime or bystander cries out, and other bystanders are called to assist in arresting the criminal who has been witnessed committing a crime. Hey, get over here. Help me out. Yeah. Uh, this guy's naked. So, so it was like, see something, say something. Right. This guy's passed out. He's having a seizure. Yeah. <laughs> come help him. Just come sit on him. <laughs> yeah. uh, most people were more comfortable relying on community policing than a permanent police force, which they believed would infringe on civil liberties. Imagine that. Hmm, huh? Weird. In the first half of the 1700s, town authorities started passing local improvement acts that included budgets for watchmen to patrol at night. The public was worrying more about property crime because also this is like the beginning of, of capitalism too. You get stuff. Yeah, yeah right. you got to protect yourself. Right. That's really what police is for is protecting <laughs> stuff. But yeah. yeah, the public was worrying more about property crime and they were more interested in stories about crime thanks to the invention of daily newspapers. Oh, so this the crime is the thing, blotter. From the beginning of newspapers, it was, all about, on? It was yeah. all about telling you how unsafe you are. Yeah. Um, when the real thing that's killing you is the gin. Yeah. No. <laughs> and there's yeah. advertisements for gin in the newspaper. Yeah, yeah. gin. It's the gin weekly. <laughs> yeah, life sucks. Gin me. <laughs> this news. <laughs> this article brought to you by gin. Yeah. <laughs> life sucks and then you gin. <laughs> the newspapers were publishing more and more sensationalistic stories about notable crimes and attacks. Colorful criminals were as beloved as the dashing lawmen who pursued them. Oh. Um, dashing. You know, because I guess that's like part of the thing too is is that you know you have this thing where, well, now you're like, hey, look at this guy that keeps getting away with stuff. Must so be doing something right. It's uh, um, <laughs> it's, it's you know, people buy it for supporting the crime and they buy it for being afraid of it. But right. everybody buys it, right? Yeah. Well, Among- and, and you know, uh, um, 
I guess that goes back to um, Robin Hood. Of course, yeah. You know, he, he was a criminal. Don't yeah. Like him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're telling you it's a scourge, and you're like, well, what kind of scourge <laughs> is it? <laughs> Plus, you know, when you're all out the bar drinking gin, it gives you something to talk about. Yeah. Exactly. Um, among all the new thieves, highwaymen and pirates were, uh, a few were lucky enough to become uh, celebrity criminals, made famous in the media for their outrageous antics that defied laws and societal conventions. The most notorious lawman and lawbreaker in London's criminal heyday was one Jonathan Wilde. Historians have compared him to an 18th century Al Capone. He was a common man who rose from obscurity to amass great fortune and even greater infamy. But the actions of one young, handsome rival would topple his criminal empire once and for all. Handsome. Hello. Oh. Guy's hot, too. Wait till I drink some gin, it's gonna be hotter. Oh my his exact birth date is unknown, but Jonathan Wilde was born in 1682 or 83 in Wolverhampton, or possibly in the village of Bonningdale, close to Birmingham. Wolverhampton had a population of around 6,000, with many folks working in iron-related trades. London had a population of 600,000 or so. Jonathan was the oldest of five siblings and got baptized at St. Peter's Collegiate Church. Though his father, John, worked as a carpenter and his mother sold produce at a local market, the family was really poor. Jonathan attended the free school in St. John's Lane before taking an apprenticeship with a local buckle maker. That's a good, I mean, there's one guy that made buckles. Yeah, and you got to buckle your shoes, <laughs> yeah, your hat, exactly. and your belt. Yeah. You buckle everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fucking. The pilgrims, they yeah. fucking bulk of the sails. <laughs> Yeah, they love that shit. Yeah. Put it on their fucking hats so they could squeeze yeah. their fucking yeah. melons. They could squeeze all the shitty ideas out of their brains. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, an apprentice was contracted to work for seven years, starting around the age of 14. Post-apprenticeship, Wilde got married and had a son. He was a servant when he came to London in 1704, but his master dismissed him and Wilde returned to Wolverhampton. He came back to London in 1708 when he was about 26 years old. Not much is known about Wilde's first two years in London. In March 1710, he was arrested for debt and sent to Wood Street Compter, a debtor's prison in the city of London. Yikes. During the 1700s, more than 10,000 people were being sentenced to prison for debts every fuck, year. Fuck. 10,000 people. Jeez. Jeez. <laughs> Just for debt. But serving a prison sentence would not absolve you of your debt. Uh, in order to get released, the debtor still had to somehow repay their debts in full. English hmm. And he it can't work when you're in prison. Well, well it's a debtor's prison. So English you, prisons were uniformly corrupt with jailers surviving off of bribes for every minor comfort. If a debtor had some money, they could pay the jailers to let them have visitors in their cells or even perform a fleet marriage, a prison marriage ceremony. Cool. Prisoners could buy permission to do business from their cells. Oh. The fleet prison and King's Bench prison would even allow inmates to live near the prison and check in. <laughs> the jailers at Wood Street liked Wilde because he was always running errands for them. Eventually, he was making enough money to pay off his debts and the cost of his imprisonment. He was even lending money to other prisoners. At night, the staff gave Wilde liberty of the gate, meaning he got let out to help catch thieves. <laughs> He's basically uh, working for the prison. Yeah. Yeah, and the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While out tracking down robbers, or according to another source while in prison, Wilde met a nice sex worker and pickpocket named Mary Milner, Aww. or Mary Molyneux. A She's, nice sex worker. A nice, a very no, nice. No, no, some well, of them I mean, are nice. There's fifty thousand of them. Some I'm of sure. Are, some of them are mean. Uh, yeah. Oh, you betcha. Yeah. Um, even the nice ones, I bet. <laughs> she saw promise in Wilde and taught him some criminal tactics. At this time, Daniel Defoe, the English journalist, was reporting on the news from the courts uh, and local crime. He would go on to become a pamphleteer, a novelist most known for his works *Robinson Crusoe* and *Mall of Flanders*. Yes. Defoe is some called, uh, sometimes called the father of the English novel. According to Defoe. Mary brought Wilde into her merry gang of thieves and whores. Cool. In 1712, Parliament asked an act, uh, passed an act for the relief of insolvent debtors, which allowed Wilde to get out of debtor's prison. He was 30 years old, hitting the London streets with a whole bunch of new criminal contacts and skills. And whores. Yeah. Yeah, daddy. Yeah. And he's also, you know, he's got all the, everything he learned in prison. Yeah. He went to live in Mary, uh, with Mary in Covent, Covent Garden, even though both of them were already married to other people. Mary went night walking and Wilde served as her tough. Their scheme Smart. became known as buttock and twang. Mary, the buttock, uh -huh. would entice a customer into a dark corner where Jonathan, the twang, would hit him with a cudgel. <laughs> Sometimes fuck him. <laughs> Let's fuck him. <laughs> hit He's out cold. First. <laughs> <laughs> they would then rob him and take off. If it, didn't, it didn't take long for a while to be thoroughly schooled in the ways of the criminal underworld and its people. Mary be began acting as a madam to other sex workers and Wilde was operating as a fence a receiver of stolen goods. Mm. Then Wilde moved on to disposing of stolen goods and paying bribes to get robbers out of prison. Wilde ended up leaving Mary, but not before cutting off her ear to mark her as a sex worker. Jesus Christ. 
I don't know what the fuck that's about, man. What? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm out of here, but before I go, what slice was Van Gogh a sex worker? Oh, he wishes. Um. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know what to make of that. I don't it's either. Not good. I think it's bad. It's very. It's very. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's not good. Yeah. yeah. As business and trade increased in London, so did property crime. More commercial goods like pick, uh, uh, pocket watches, pistols, wigs. And wigs. Pers- <laughs> and, and, and wigs. And wigs. And personalized notebooks meant more opportunities for stealing and selling stolen goods. In 1712, a thief taker named Charles Hitchin said that he personally knew about 2,000 Londoners who worked as thieves. <laughs> Hitchin had been named uh, London's under marshal or the city's top policeman in 1711. His annual salary was 700 pounds, which is about 105,000 pounds in 2024 money. Okay. Yeah. Reasonable. He routinely abused the powers of office. Oh. He was an extortionist of, of the highest order, extorting mo- money both from thieves and victims. Arrests were made very selectively, and Hitchin got thieves out of jail if they bribed him enough. And you said uh, he was a cop? He was, uh, so, yeah, they called him. Uh, I just can't. I can't. They called him the thief, uh, thief taker, uh, and uh, they called him the, the London's under marshal. It's amazing how nothing has changed. He was an extortion of the highest order, extorting money from thieves and victims. Uh, arrests were made select- selectively, and he got thieves out of jail if they bribed him enough. He coerced male sex workers in brothels called Molly Houses to give them services for free. Male sex workers? Yes. Yeah. You want to stay out of jail? You got to suck the fucking suck thing. Suck the fucking thing, yeah. man. If you go to jail, you're going to be sucking the fucking thing, so might as well do it without, outside of jail. Yeah. 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 Might as well do a lofty politician like me. <laughs> be somebody. Uh, the London Board of Aldermen was investigating Hitchin when he gave that testimony about how many thieves he knew of. The board suspended Hitchin in 1713. Around that time, Hitchin approached Wilde about becoming one of his thief-taking assistants. For every felon you turned in, the city paid a 40-pound reward, which is about 6,000 pounds today. <laughs> Hitchin's associates were known as the mathematicians. Uh, one of these mathematicians Nerds. probably got to know Wilde during his time in debtor's prison and vouched for him to Hitchin, and that's how he got the job. Uh... One of Hitchens' mathematicians, William Field, would go on to work for a while. Now, the War of Spanish Succession ended in 1714, so there was a lot of uh, demobilized soldiers out in the streets getting into crime, getting drunk. <laughs> uh, he was uh, Hitchin was made under marshal again, and Wilde was busy with his thief-taking operation. He opened an office in Blue Boar Tavern and called himself a deputy of Hitchens, but never received an op- official appointment. He carried a sword as a sign of his authority and his uh, and his pretentious uh, his. Pre- and his pretentious of gen- gentility. Wilde worked a system that allowed him to amass riches while still appearing to be on the right side of the law. He was able to hold his scheme and his gang together because of the fear of theft and the public's reaction to theft. It was illegal to sell stolen goods, and by 1720, the, pen- the penalty had been increased to death. They just went in full, like, just, we don't, like, it's just got to be deterrent, you know? Well, that must have stopped him. Yeah. Um... A low-level thief trying to fence stolen goods ran a tremendous risk. The higher the price, uh, the stolen good, the, the stiffer the penalty in courts. Wilde had his gang members either pick pockets or mug people outright. His thieves gave him the goods they stole, and Wilde waited for the robbery to be announced in the papers. Wilde would claim that he found the stolen goods and return them for a reward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so you just you figure out the new system. Thinker. Yeah. The reward was to cover the expenses of running his, his agency. He never pretended that the goods he had weren't stolen. He claimed at all times that he was policing thieves and just so happened to come across their merchandise. Sometimes he would also anonymously arrange uh, a swap. Sure. Um, at any time, Wilde could turn in any of his thieves to the authorities, and the threat kept them in line. Uh, Wilde helped police arrest thieves who were potential rivals. Yeah. So if you weren't working for them. Yeah, so they, you, yeah. Just, you, you just go legitimate, and, and then you can steal. All yeah, you want. it's like you're like a... Uh, 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 Frank Costello, a yeah. FBI informant from The Departed. You just right. you narc on all your yeah. You grass rival. up grass up the guys that are in your way. Yeah. yeah, and then the government wants you to do it. Um, yeah. even members of his own gang that wouldn't cooperate, he would he would grass up. Um, You're a tattletale. <laughs> he yeah. controlled the pickpockets on Drury Lane, the Star Glazers who cut open shop windows, and the wig snatchers, the footpads, and the highwaymen. The wig snatchers. <laughs> if there's any lower <laughs> profession, I'd like to hear. <laughs> the wig snatcher? You bastard. I think the only thing lower is a wig snatchy. <laughs> now you're there without your fucking <laughs> yeah, wig. Like yeah, but you're, you're a victim. Hey! You're a victim. <laughs> you're not, that's not your profession. 
Yeah, they would. The problem is, is you yell, you go, "Hey, I was robbed." And they go, "Fucking bald asshole, what do you want?" Yeah, I think they they would do it too because it, you're not gonna put much of much of a fight when somebody grabs your wing. <laughs> Give me that fucking thing. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so, my dignity. Oh, <laughs> <It's> so cold. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I'm bald with lice. Yeah, I do it. guy's girlfriend starts screaming. <laughs> <laughs> He's not as hungry as I thought. <laughs> you don't have those big curly white locks. <laughs> Just, they still is murking too. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> sometimes I use my murk and as a way. <laughs> um, if the stolen goods opened the door for blackmail, Wilde didn't wait for the papers. For instance, he advertised in the Daily po- uh, in the Daily Post quote lost the first of October a black shagreen pocketbook edged with silver with some notes of hand <laughs> on October first. A pocketbook or tape book with silver edges that included some notes of hand, meaning signatures, was lost. That uh, The said book was lost in the Strand near Fountain Tavern at about 7 or 8 o'clock at night, um, which was a known brothel. Cool. The owner of that date book knows that Wilde has their name and knows that they were at a brothel. If they pay him off, they get the date book back, and he stays quiet. Oh, my God. Smart. Uh, he now saw, saw himself as a rival of Hitchens. He's outgrown him and uh, not just a subordinate. Uh, he, he works on taking out as many of Hitchens' thieves as possible. <laughs> In 1718, Hitchens tried to expose Wilde through a manuscript, a true discovery of conduct of receivers and thief takers in and about the city of London. He claimed that Wilde was the source of crime and a manager of thieves. He was. <laughs> <laughs> Wilde published his own manuscript in reply, an answer to the late insolent libel. He claimed that Hinchins was gay and regularly visited Bali houses. He was. And, <laughs> and, he, um, and he did. That really uh, topped the other. Topped? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what people care about. It's more salacious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much ruined Hitchens. It also should be said, though, that when um, he supplanted Hitchens, um, the way he did it and siphoned off so many of his gang was to get um, their thieves would also be higher paid. He would take a lesser cut than Hitchens was, was uh, taking. Yeah. Hitchens was greedier, right. so he was he was taking a smaller thing from the person that reported the goods, and he was taking a smaller fee from the people that stole the goods. So sure smart, that well. smart move. But yeah, and then you got everybody going, and you know business is good, and um, you know that's also why Hitchens was uh, sidelined for two years. They were like, we haven't caught you doing it. We know something's up. Get the fuck out of here for two years. Um. Hitchin fired back with another anti-wild piece, The Regulator. Oh, that's a good, finally a good know. title. But yeah. between the gay accusations and the prior suspension, Hitchens lost all power in the criminal underworld and, and law enforcement. Wilde then held the monopoly on London like Al Capone did in Chicago. Pretty it was cool. said that Wilde kept a record of every thief that worked for him and what robberies they committed. When someone had outlived their usefulness, he turned them over and, 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 to hang and took the 40-pound reward. <sighs> This system inspired an urban legend around the origin of the phrase double cross. Supposedly, uh, Wilde would mark a cross next to a thief's name in the records if they did something to bother him. If they messed up twice, they'd get two crosses next to their name, and that would seal their fate. Damn. Um, I mean, people must have been desperate for, to work for him because it's not a, it doesn't sound like a good, like a good workplace. Uh, but officially, the phrase double cross did not come into English uh, use until 1834, so who knows if that's where it came from. Uh, Wilde loved publicizing the thief taking and looking like a hero to the public. He claimed to have had 60 thieves sent to the gallows. In 1718, he started calling himself the thief taker general of Great Britain and Ireland. <laughs> the Old Bailey Court was extremely busy, so Wilde's office saw a lot of action. Often a victim of a robbery would go to Wilde's office before the crime had ever, even been reported in the paper. They'd find that Wilde's agents had already recovered the stolen items. Wilde would, offer oh, to help, oh, recovered, Wilde like. would offer to help them apprehend the thieves for an extra fee. In 1720, the Privy Council consulted with Wilde on ways to control London's crime. He suggested that they increase the rewards for evidence against thieves. <laughs> yeah. Within the year, it went from 40 to 140 oh, for turning over God. the thief. So he just upped his, his own pay. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Look, he's got a good thing going here, you know? According to historians, Wilde... Is, is he is scumbag Robin Hood. Yeah, 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 yeah. man. It's pretty nuts. <laughs> According to historians, Wilde was either ignored by or outright favored by Whig politicians. Whigs were somewhat more liberal than the Tories who were more critical of Wilde. In 1718, a group of Tories tried to combat Wilde by strengthening the laws against receiving stolen property. Their plan backfired, though. Thieves had a harder time fencing through, uh, uh, through goods but any, anyone but Wilde. 
The press loved covering Wilde's battles with thieves, plus he made it easy. He approached papers with the tales of his bravery, and the papers reported his accounts. When Wilde re- rounded up 21 members of the Carrick Gang in the summer of 24... <laughs> Carrick <laughs> Gang? Carrick. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> Carrick Gang. No, I think that's an Irish gang. It became uh, the season's biggest news story. Not least of all because Wilde received an 800-pound reward, Ooh, which boy. is about 133000 now. Jesus Christ. Um, God. It's government workers, man. All yeah. Finding ways to... <laughs> One of the Carrick Gang members got released from prison. Wilde tracked him down on further information related to his criminality and re- arrested the guy again. After he got released? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Uh, while people saw a man relentlessly defending the public order, Wilde was just a gangster ensuring a rival was behind bars. Yeah. Um, England was starting to deal with some economic chaos around uh, 1720 because of the South Sea bubble busting. Similar to the ec- economic crash of 2008, people lost confidence in financial institutions and the government. By 1724, the people were desperate for law and order. They were looking for heroes to fight the endemic corruption. Uh-oh. In, in April of 24, one of Wilde's agents, James Helen Fury Sykes, <laughs> arrested a 22-year-old thief named Jack Shepard. His middle name was Hell and Fury? He was nicknamed Hell and Fury. That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Not Hell and Fury. Yeah, no, it, it took me a second there. <laughs> be like, wow, they, they even used hyphenated names back then. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a gender fluid situation. <laughs> Is that what he's arrested for? Is that James Hell and Fury? No. <laughs> um, he's wearing a wig. So they arrested 20 th- th- 22-year-old thief named Jack Shepard. Jack had committed a burglary in Clara Market. Um, on February 5th, in the past, Shepard had worked with Wilde, but he wasn't, uh, fond of having a boss. So, you know, fuck that. Go into business for yourself. That's You're right. the boss. John Jack Shepard was born March 4th, 1702, in London's Spitalfields. Spitalfields. Oh. In the Spitalfields. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Where uh, the lick spittles are. Yeah. It's, uh, East London. He was baptized, uh, just a day old, suggesting his parents feared he wouldn't live long. He was named after an older brother, John, who had passed away. Oh, Every, spittle. So. Everyone called him Jack's, uh, uh, Jack, or nicknames like Jack the Lad, or <laughs> Gentleman Jack, or Honest Jack. Uh, I mean, no other names just have just the series of nicknames, no matter what you do. You're, yeah. That's, that's it. Jack? Yeah. You, these are the seven things we can call you. Yeah. He had a brother named Thomas and a younger sister named Mary. Their father was a carpenter. Um, just like Donaldson Wilde's father had been, but Jack's father passed away when he was very young. Mary died two years later, Jesus the sister. Christ. Jack's mom couldn't support the family alone, so she sent a six-year-old Jack to a workhouse. Ugh. Six. Uh, that was Mr. Garrett's school. It's like it's like a it's like a debtor's prison, but uh, for children. Yeah. In Britain and Ireland, workhouses were institutions ran by parishes where the poor received work and housing. In 1776, England and Wales had about 1,800 workhouses. The Workhouse Test Act of 1723 required that anyone who sought poor relief, donations, or charity had to enter a workhouse before they got anything um, and perform a set amount of work typically for no money. Oh, good. It's, uh, well, you that should help. You earn your keep. And, and nothing else. And fuck all else. By the 18th century, workhouses had devolved into a kind of mixed holding facility for every type of poor person. Whether they were healthy or sick, criminal, innocent, or male, six. female, <laughs> yeah. sane, insane, they all ended up in the workhouse. If there was a high demand for labor, the parishes could contract out their, their poor. Oh, well, that's good. It, what is this six-year-old doing? Uh, he's he, juggling. Juggling? No, I mean, probably... Uh, juggling two jobs. Yeah. Uh, things you need small hands for. Yeah. Uh, sewing. Get, work, like fixing the machines. Microchips. Yeah, yes. Microchips. Yeah. Exactly. Huh? Thank you. Working the conveyor belt. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Uh, oh, fix it. Getting, uh, getting inside. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, they can crawl in uh, b- b- uh, boilers and mm-hmm. all kinds Chimney of things. Chimney sweeps. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All types of shit. Um. Oh, fixing the train from uh, Snowpiercer. Yep. Yeah. And and then if there was too much competition on the labor market, the poor were kept idle. So while he was still a young boy, Jack was said to work as an apprentice for a cane chair maker. The man paid Jack an allowance of 20 shillings for his work, but he passed away after not too long. Jack went to work for a different cane chair maker, but that man treated him very badly. When Jack was 10, his mom was working for a wool draper who owned a shop on the Strand, William Kneebone. She got Kneebone to hire Jack as a shop boy. Kneebone sounds like a good guy. He taught Jack how to read and write, then apprenticed him to a carpenter. 
The carpenter, appropriately, appropriately named Owen Wood, ran a shop on Winch Street off Drury Lane in Covent Garden. I love this poem. On April 2nd, 1717, 15-year-old Jack Shepard signed a seven-year apprenticeship contract with Wood. Oh, okay. What, what was his signing bonus? Uh, I don't know. I guess doesn't get doesn't get yeah. stabbed. Did he work with Otani at all? <laughs> he was determined to rise above the poverty he'd been born into. Five years on, Shepard showed great talent for carpentry. He was only 5'4", but his slight build belied an astounding strength. He had a pale face, large dark eyes, a wide mouth, and was quick to smile. His service record with Wood had been unblemished. You guys okay? <laughs> it's just, well, each of those descriptions is pale face, dark eyes. Okay, so uh, wide mouth, quick to smile. That's, just, uh, that's the same thing. It's well, I mean, you know, this is how we got the, 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 the rep, uh, reputation, I guess, as, as being... Um, Happy Jack? Uh, yeah, they said basically, like, his smile would kind of get him out of a lot of trouble. And he was, oh, and he was nice. good looking. Um... A button molder named jo Joseph Hain managed a tavern in Jury Lane called the Br Black Lion. He encouraged the local apprentices to hang out at his tavern. Now, Jack Shepard's autobiographical narrative claims that he was an innocent youth before he started going to the Black Lion Tavern. It was at that spot that he d started developing his taste for liquor and for easy women. Cool. His good looks and slight stutter made him popular at the Black Lion and other Jury Lane taverns. Many criminals who also spent time at the Black Lion, like Joseph Blueskin Blake and the thief taker John General Jonathan Wilde. The origin of the blue skin nickname is not known today. It could be due to him having a lot of facial hair or maybe a port wine stained birthmark or a pony reference to his, to his friend Blewett. No, oh, maybe a colloidal silver. Mm -hmm. One woman of easy virtue, Elizabeth Lyon, became extremely fond of Jack. <laughs> Lyon went by the nickname Edgeworth, Edgeworth Bess for her birthplace on Edge of Edgeworth in Middlesex. Um... Laura adds a fun fact here. <clears throat> Laura grew up in Wilmington, Massachusetts, which is in Middlesex County, and her middle name is Elizabeth. <laughs> well, uh, how about that? I'll huh? buy that for a dollar. And she steal wigs. Yes, and she has a known wig thief. Mm -hmm. We really must catch her. <laughs> Daniel Defoe described Bess as, quote, a main lodestone in attracting of him up to his eminence of guilt. So a lodestone is a magnet, and eminence means fame. So Bess was like a magnet that attracted Jack to the criminal lifestyle that would bring him so much fame. Jack would later say that Bess was the source of his ruin. The American historian Peter Linebaugh offers a different take. He believes that Bess liberated Jack from the drudgery of his apprenticeship, and he evolved from being a pious and obedient to self-confident and rebellious. Yes. Cool. It wasn't long before Jack was habitually drinking and whoring. <laughs> Inevitably, his carpentry suffered. <laughs> Liberated. <laughs> I don't know how to put this fucking yeah, shit together. Fucking wood bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I got a wet dick, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> he was insolent and disobedient to his master. With Bess's encouragement, Jack started augmenting his legitimate wages with criminal activities. Liberated. Yeah, liberated. His first recorded theft took place sometimes in the spring, uh, in the spring of 1723, he was running an errand for his master at the Rummer Tavern in Charing Cross and stole two silver spoons. Couldn't do that. Shouldn't do that. He, uh, he didn't um, get caught for the shoplifting, so he moved on to larger crimes. <laughs> he would lift goods from the houses he worked in as a carpenter. On August 2nd, 1723, he quit his apprenticeship contract with two years remaining. He kept working as a journeyman carpenter, though. Occasionally, Jack wasn't suspected officially. Excuse, excuse me. Jack wasn't suspected of any of the crimes he took part in. Once Jack started working with some of Wilde's gang, he progressed to burglary. Uh. Cool. Jack and Bess moved to Fulham, where they lived as husband and wife. A few months later, they moved to Piccadilly. When Bess got arrested and locked up in St. Giles Road Roundhouse, Jack tried to visit her. One of the prison officials, known as, known as a beetle, Mr. Brown, would not allow it. So Jack broke into the prison and escaped with Bess out of a window. Hey, 5'4". Uh, yeah, gotta get yeah. your gotta get your girl out of prison. Yeah, yeah. If you really love her, yeah. <laughs> Tail he burgled stuff. her. He, he burgled. He, yeah. he, that was yeah. an official burgle. Yeah, he's a uh, he left two spoons in her place. Yep. On February fifth, seventeen twenty four, Jack committed a burglary in Clare Market with Bess and his brother Tom. Tom also worked as a carpenter, but he got caught stealing his master's tools the previous <laughs> autumn. <laughs> the masters, the master's tools. I don't know where the tools are, dude. I don't know. Tom got a burn. Can't work. <laughs> uh, Tom was uh, got a burn, like a, a a brand on his hand, marking him as the thief. Well, it's beats getting your ear cut off for being a hooker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, none of it's good. No, no. But you can paint over a brand. You can make up. You can wear a mitten. Yeah. yeah it works. Wear cool gloves. Cut yeah. your hand off. What are you gonna do then? Cut, cut your hand. Yeah, you could cut your Take head. Take it to Alabama or uh-huh. fucking Pensacola. That's right. <laughs> Dub City. Man. Dub, Dub, Dub City. Baby, I'm rich. <laughs> Can you drive me? Uh, on April 24th, 1720. So, yeah, um, he got arrested for thieving a second time. He feared uh, that he'd be hanged. Uh, so, he told his the, the law about his burglary with Jack and Bess. A warrant was issued Jesus for Jack's arrest. Christ, Tom. Snitched, snitched on his brother <sighs> and Bess. Uh, Jack stayed on Wilde's radar because he fenced some of his stolen goods through Wilde's agent, William Field. Uh, Wilde got one of his guys, James Helen Fury Sykes, to challenge Jack to a game of Skittles at a public house. Taste the rainbow. <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that where you go to a, a male brothel and you just taste the rainbow? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want you to fuck every dude of every color. <laughs> These are the places England <laughs> has fought wars in. <laughs> um, Skittles is a precursor to modern nine-pin bowling. Okay, oh. you're right. Yes, okay. At the match, Sykes gave uh, Jack over to a constable from St. Giles Parish named Mr. Price, and he took the 40-pound reward. There's <laughs> a lot of Skittles. So he's like, hey, show up and let's do some bowling. Yeah, let's bowling. And he just gets arrested. <laughs> Fuck. Fuck! Do I still get to bowl? Yeah. <laughs> I lost the bigger game. <laughs> now game I'm in on. the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> the magistrate, Justice Parry, had Jack imprisoned overnight at St. Child's Roundhouse on the top floor. He planned to question Jack further in the morning, but uh, it only took Jack about three hours to escape. He broke through the timber ceiling and lowered himself to the ground with a rope he made out of bed sheets. A crowd had formed outside the jail, drawn by the sounds of a prisoner breaking out. <laughs> What's all that ruckus? Yeah. <laughs> Jack was still wearing, like, shackles on his on his legs. Cool. He uh, just nonchalantly joins the crowd after he lowers himself down and pointed to the shadows on the roof, and he was like, there he goes! <laughs> oh, my God. The invisible and man! And then he fucking boogies on out of there. That's <laughs> 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 so stupid. <laughs> I think he took that guy's wallet. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break right here, and uh, we'll come back. And uh, now, now the, the public is, is really uh, is really on uh, to see Wild capture Jack because he's uh, I mean he's he keeps getting keeps breaking out, you know, keep breaking ladies out. He's breaking out himself. We'll be right back, folks. And we're back. Hey. So he shimmies off in his shackles. Hey, who's that up there on the roof? Um, There he goes. So the escape uh, intensified uh, the desire uh, in Jonathan Wilde to see Jack arrested and put out a commission. On May 19, 1724, Jack got caught in the act of picking a pocket in Leicester Square, and he was transported to St. Anne's Roundhouse in Soho. Best visited Jack on the 20th. Did she break him out? And the guards let her in his cell when she said she was his wife. They were uh, Jack and Bess were both moved to the new prison at Clerkenwell. Um, she had herself turned in uh, for something. You know, or, oh. or, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She had herself turned in for something. She didn't move in with him on... Um, and uh, on May 25th, Jack launched their escape. Uh, yeah. They, mean- they filed through their manacles, and uh, Jack removed a bar from their cell window. Uh, they... <laughs> They knotted a bed sheet into a rope and descended to the ground level. Uh, to escape from the prison yard, uh, they had to scale a 22-foot high prison wall. Um, oh, you know, it seemed pretty capable. And the newspapers were particularly fond of this escape story because the 5'4 Jack had carried his very tall and buxom partners through their adventure. So uh, she's, like, on his back when they're scaling down the sheet. Oh, and she's tall and buxom? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. And he's just little guy. And he's strong. Either, either he's draping um, over his shoulders, you know. So like, now uh, Jack's abilities as an escapist and a thief genuinely have impressed Wild. So uh, he was like, Jack can keep thieving. He was about to be hanged. Yeah, he's, he's earned his keep. Yeah. Yeah, and he would just uh, have to give uh, Wild his stolen goods to fence and let him take a cut. Uh, but Jack still turned him down. Cool. And, and uh, he worked with Blueskin uh, Blake instead, you know. <laughs> oh, Blueskin Blake. <laughs> yeah. 
a colorful character. On July 12th, 1724, Blake joined Jack in robbing the house of his former master, William Kneebone. <sighs> Jack, also Kneebone. Fenced, uh, Jack also fenced some goods through William Field, who was an agent of Wilde. So Wilde knows that he's fencing through somebody that's not him. And he doesn't like that. And he does not Uh-oh. like that. Um, on the 19th of, of July, um, Jack and Blake uh, teamed up for some highwayman action. Uh, robbing carriages on the Hampstead Road. Uh, Field informed Wilde about what Jack had been up to, and he was incensed. Uh, that was the last straw. Jack Shepard could not continue to operate outside of his control. Just these these highways, you know? Not not a lot of uh, help out there. No. Wilde figured... You're on your own. Yeah. Wilde figured that uh, Edgeworth Bess might be the weak link in the chain. On uh, the 22nd of July, Wilde lured her to a brandy shop and plied her with drinks until she revealed Jack's location. Uh, the next day, one of Wilde's... <laughs> that works. The next day, one of uh, Wilde's henchmen, Quilt Arnold... <laughs> what are the names? And his brother, Rag Arnold. Yeah. Quilt. And little Blanky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Come, Rag. Uh, they tracked Jack down to a brandy shop owned by Blake's mother. It was... Uh, <laughs> ja- <laughs> Blake Blueskin's mom. So, so brandy is back on the menu. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, Eng- it's English brandy at the Blueskin. Piss. I think you're probably going to be you, like, you, first of all, you got your thieving, so you got money to spend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Second of all, it's very easy to get caught if you drink that gin. Yeah, yeah you fucking yeah. die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, two two pennies, and you're uh, you're laying down on the straw. Yeah, mm-hmm. don't even have to buy any rope. <laughs> get uh, the rope. <laughs> So this was uh, Jack's third arrest, and he was taken to Newgate Prison. On August 12th, Jack was put on trial for three charges of burglary. He was acquitted of the first two charges for lack of evidence, but the last burglary charge was for the robbery at William Kneebone's house on July 12th. Now, William, former Knee- master. William Kneebone, William Field, mm-hmm. and Jonathan Wilde all presented e- evidence against Jack on that charge. He was found guilty and sentenced to die. He was put in the condemned hold at Newgate Prison to await his hanging. On August 31st, he received a death warrant from the court uh, uh, naming September 4th as his execution date. But for a third time, Jack escaped from prison. When the public got to read the details of his latest <laughs> escape in the papers, they fell in love with Jack even more. <laughs> they saw Jack as a young, handsome, cockney rascal trying to, to be with the woman he loved. He was nonviolent, and he had the face of a nice young man, not a hardened criminal. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Pale face, dark eyes, and wide yeah. smile. Yeah. Jack yeah. Skellington. Yeah. Did, and, how did, did, uh, do you know how he escaped? Shoddy craftsmanship. All the, all, <laughs> yeah. the, all the all the apprentices quit after two years. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, so this is journeyman. These bars pull right out. So he, uh, yeah, it was uh, that, that was the. I guess it must have been the, the day he was given his execution date. He escaped because the Daily <laughs> Journal printed a piece on Jack on September first. Saying, quote, yesterday a most surprising appen- accident happened at Newgate, which is as followeth, viz. John Shepard, the malefactor aforementioned, finding himself ordered for execution and being provided of saws, files, and other implements, <laughs> the prisoner John Sh- uh, found an opportunity to cut off one of the great iron spikes over the door of the condemned hold, at which the prisoners usually converse with their friends. And being of a very slender body, got himself through into the lodge, and then from thence into the street, and so escaped, assisted by his wife and another woman. Oh. Who? Who's that? Um, her name was Paul Maggot. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Maggot? Yeah. <laughs> like Polly. Paul. Sure, yeah, you're right. Paul Maggot. Sure. <laughs> you know, from the Maggot family. Uh. The sex worker. Uh. Paul Maggot. Uh, excuse me, love. What's your name? <laughs> That's that was her stage name. Yeah, her real name was worse. <laughs> <laughs> Maggot. Uh, yeah, Paul, Paul Maggot. Paul Maggot. Woman. Yeah, Paul. P O L L, like Polly. Oh, Paul Maggot. Oh, okay. Still, I said that. You didn't hear that? Yeah, but I was I was still thinking Polly, like Polly Walnut. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, gotcha, yeah, gotcha, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, Bess and Paul came to Newgate for a visit and smuggled in a woman's nightgown. The two women distracted the guards while Jack loosened one of the iron bars in his cell's windows. He was able to remove the iron bar and slip through the gap in the window. He put on the nightgown that Paul and Bess had slipped him, and the three of them made their way out of the prison's front door. Just like a, a, he was a, a lady? Yeah. The a guards, wide smile. The guards didn't realize guy. what had happened until it was too late, um, which is not so surprising since there were about 90 prisoners for every guard at Newgate. <laughs> 90 to 1. <laughs> 
Should have been a fucking bloodbath every day. Um, the journal printed more details from the escape the next day. Quote, we are certainly informed that John Shepard went off by water uh, between 7 and 8 on Monday night least, last at Brackfriars Stairs. The waterman saw his irons under his nightgown, and he was much terrified thereat. He landed him at the horse ferry at Westminster, and for which he rewarded him with seven pence. Um, so that means Jack took a coach to Blackfriar, Blackfriar Stairs. He boarded a boat up the River Thames to Westminster, where he walked to a warehouse that he used to hide stolen goods, completing his escape. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, on September 4th, the Daily Journal printed this letter from Jack Shepard to Jack Ketch, um, which is a generic term for a hangman. So he's addressing mm. his hangman. Sir, I thank you for the favor you intended me this day, and to show that I am in charity, I am now drinking your health, and a bon repos to poor Joseph and Anthony. I am gone a few days for the air. Bars and chains are but ter- trifling obstacles in the way of your friend and servant, John <laughs> Shepard, from my residence in Terra Australis Incognito. <laughs> that day, Joseph Ward and Anthony Upton were hanged without Jack as he was trying to give the press and the people the idea that he'd fled the country for Australia. Um, so he was saying goodbye to them. Mm-hmm. Um, he visited a friend's ham- uh, family in Northamptonshire for a few days, but he soon returned to London. Wild's men attempted to but failed to capture Jack on September 9th, but that day a different posse from Newgate found Jack. He was quite drunk and in his hiding spot on Finchley Good. with a companion. Oh. They were both dressed up to look like butchers wearing aprons. <laughs> ah. On September 11th, the Daily <laughs> Journal published the details of Jack's capture. I'm just a simple butcher. I'm... Yeah. Okay. Quote, Shepard took to the hedges. <laughs> <laughs> we're being closely pursued and discovered and pistols presented to his head he begged them for god's sake not to shoot him on the spot trembled was in great agony agony and submitted <laughs> what a little cock I'll <laughs> <laughs> suck your cock uh, oh you guys I'll oh, suck your cock won't I <laughs> <laughs> oh you could call me Polly. Yeah, yeah I'm a maggot yeah Jack was hiding in the hedges um um yeah, so uh, when they searched him, they found he had two silver watches, a large knife, and a chisel. The posse returned him to the, uh, to the condemned cell at Newgate Prison. Uh, they shackled him to the floor this time with chains, and he told the guards the following statements that wa- made their way to the paper. Quote, He has hinted in dark terms that he hath committed robberies since his escape, and denies that he ever married to the woman that assisted him therein. He found her a common strumpet in Drury Lane, <laughs> and that she hath been the cause of all his mith- misfortunes and misery. He takes great pains to excuse his companion, Paige, of being anyways privy to his crimes, whom he says only generously accompanied him after his escape. He hath promised to clear his conscience as this day, as to, as to, and to be more particular in his confessions, as, as, as entertaining no hopes of life. Um, so yeah, he's denying he was ever married to Bess. He's uh, saying he did commit more robberies since escaping. But my buddy Paige uh, is in Yeah. Here. And uh and uh yeah, he's saying I'm I'm gonna die, so I'm clearing my conscience here. Yeah. On the fourteenth of September, uh the Daily Journal reports that Jack was taken up to the chapel at Newgate and there was a great crowd of people to see him. He confessed that on September eighth he drank at several public houses and picked two people's pockets in the cloisters. Then he headed onto Fleet Street where he took notice of Mr. Martin's a watchmaker's shop. <laughs> there was only a little boy looking at the shop, so Jack planned to rob it. He cut out a pane of glass and took three silver watches out of the shop window. The boy saw him take the watches, but didn't take off after him. The next day, the guards found a small file that Jack had hidden in his Bible. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that. Um, on can. September, September 17th, <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. the journal printed this notice, quote, Yesterday morning, the keepers of Newgate, going into the condemned hold to Shepherd, found two files, a chisel, and a hammer, <laughs> hid in the bottom of a matter chair with which he'd begun to file his irons who, when he perceived his last effort to escape, thus discovered and frustrated, his wicked and obdurate heart began to relent, and he shed an abundance of tears. He was <laughs> carried... He cried like a little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's they said it back then, yeah. And therefore he shed an abundance of tears. <laughs> <laughs> Shedding an abundance of tears is rich. It's a, lot a great tears. phrase. He was carried up to an apartment called the castle. In the body of the jail, a place of equal, if not superior, strength to the condemned hold, and they are chained down to the floor. Um, so, uh, at that point, he demonstrated to his jailers that he could still use a small nail to unlock a horse padlock on his chains. They bound Jack tighter and handcuffed him. Daniel Defoe reported that Jack joked about the situation, saying that, I am the shepherd, 
and all the jailers in the town are my flock, and I cannot stir into the country, but they are at my heels bowing after me. So basically, they all have to follow him around because they're so scared of him escaping. Right, right. Um, yeah, good, you know, pretty good retort. On September 21st, Jack confessed to the court that he and Joseph Bluskin Blake had robbed of Mr. Pargeter on Hampstead Road on July 20th. Throughout October, Jack made numerous but failed escaped attempts. His brother Tom got transported to the colonies as pol- punishment for his robberies. Fucking vacation. Well, you know, the colonies then weren't. Jonathan Wilde arrested Blake along with two others on October 3rd and took them to Newgate. Blake went to trial on October 15th, and William Field and Jonathan Wilde provided the evidence to convict him. Although their testimonies were inconsistent with evidence that they, they provided at Jack's trial. Nevertheless, Joseph Luskin Blake was found guilty and sentenced to hang. Blake pleaded with Wilde to intervene and get his sentence commuted to transportation since they'd worked together before. Wilde refused. An enraged Blake took a small clasp knife that he had smuggled into the courtroom and attacked Wilde. Ah! He was able to cut Wilde's throat to the windpipe before being tackled by agents Whoa! of the court. Oh my gosh. The attack created chaos in the courtroom. Wilde passed out and men carried him to a surgeon for treatment. Um, <laughs> after the attack, Wilde, Blake rejoiced saying that he should be hanged with pleasure if Wilde died before him. Damn. The disturbance in the courtroom caused a riot at Newgate Prison next door, and the chaos lasted throughout the night. The situation allowed Jack to escape for a fourth time <laughs> on October 16th. So it worked. It worked. The whole Everybody in the prison is going, we're all in here because of that fucking guy, too. Fuck him. Yeah. He, he used a nail. Yeah, seriously. Um, he used a nail to pick the locks on his handcuffs and removed his chains. He was still wearing leg irons, and he tried climbing up a chimney, but the chimney was blocked by an iron bar. He was able to dislodge the bar and use the bar to break through the ceiling into what was called the Red Room. Red Room. This was just above the castle where the Jacobite prisoners used to be held. Uh, Jack broke through six barred doors to make his way to the prison chapel. What the fuck? <laughs> From there, he climbed out a window to the roof of Newgate pr- Prison, but he could see that the drop was, was too much. He goes all the way back to his prison cell and gets the sheets. Oh, I, fr- I should have... Bro, I should have thought, thought, yeah. thought yeah. that. Yeah, that's why, that's why you store Goes his Goes all the way back out the entire escape route to the roof and then uses the blanket to climb down to the roof of an adjacent house. Can you imagine how embarrassed he must have been going back there to get that sheet? All these guys are rioting, <sighs> and his face is red. Thought I'd never see you again. <laughs> Jack broke into a house which was owned by one William Bird. Around midnight, Jack walked down to Bird's stairs and out to the street without waking anyone. Jack found a cow shed near Tottenham Court Road to hide out in. When the owner found Jack, he came up with a story about having escaped from Bridewell Prison. He said he got sent there when he couldn't provide for his bastard son. He makes up a fake bastard <laughs> son. Yeah, this fucking kid. He's like, anyway, you know. Maggot. <laughs> he goes, uh, the man let Jack go without informing authorities. After several days, Jack found a shoemaker who agreed to cut off his leg irons for 20 shillings. He told that guy the same story about the prison and the bastard son. The leg irons and manacles would later turn up in the room of one of Jack's mistresses, Kate Cook. Oh... In the Daniel Defoe's work, The History of the Remarkable Life of John Shepard, he reports many believed the devil himself had aided Jack in his Newgate escape. According to the Daily Journal, (laughs) Jack's mom went to St. James Palace on October 29th to beg the court to pardon her unfortunate son. The paper reported that Jack sent a letter to Blake, who was facing his death sentence at Newgate's condemned cell. Dear Joe, I would come and give thee an act of grace if I thought thee worthy. I am living, thou art dying, and Jonathan recovers. Curse on thy dull little clasp knife. Must I be plagued to finish what you so clumsily begun? Had I wrought with such implements? Well, comfort thyself. A couple of kicks, a shrug, a wry neck, and a pissed pair of breeches will make thee (laughs) snug and easy. But if thou art a man still, show thyself such. Step forth, bilk the prigs, and return to thy confederate and dear friend, John Shepard. Wow, really calls him out there. Say, come on. You, so, be, you fucking, you pansy dude? So an act of grace is when someone in power, like a king, shows forgiveness to someone who has done wrong. Jack is saying he would break Blake out of prison if he thought he was worthy, and he questions if he's going to have to kill Jonathan Wilde himself. A wry neck means a tilted or twisted neck. To bilk means to cheat out of something valuable. A prig is a self-righteous, moralistic person who behaves as if superior to others. If you're still a man, prove it, and cheat these uptight fuddy-duddies out of your death, escape. Confederate means ally. Um, so, pretty cool letter. Yeah. Fuck you, fuck you, I won't come get you. Break out if you're a man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and if you are, then, then we can hang out again. That'd be cool. Yeah. Like, you're not, you know, bad dude. But- um, so the thing is, is that, like, part of this thing where it's like, why, 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 in all these times, why would you not get out? And, like, it's like, the papers fucking love Jack Shepard. And yeah. I think he can't leave the fame. 
So uh, he was free for about two weeks. He dressed up like a beggar and made his way back to London. On, yeah, exactly. Yeah. On the night of October 29th, he broke into a pawn shop on Drury Lane and stole a black silk suit, a silver sword, rings, watches, a wig, and some other pieces of merchandise. He dressed up in the clothes, looking like a fine gentleman, and sold uh, the other quick items, uh, items for quick cash. He used these proceeds to go out drinking with two mistresses. <laughs> Great. All part of the act. Mm -hmm. just yep. It's part of the act. No, he's like he's sucking, he's playing skittles, sucking dick. Just part of the act. Early in the morning of November first, November first, agents found a richly dressed but blind drunk Jack Shepard and arrested him. His fifth capture. The guards even held, with the wig, even with that wig, Damn. they didn't make him as good as they are now. Well, uh, yeah. you know he was drunk. He's probably stumbling around going, Ah, Jack Shepard. Yeah, the wig's all fucked it. up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want to arrest me? <laughs> What if you just had like an afro, <laughs> <laughs> big Jerry curl thing, like uh, Jules yeah. says? <laughs> uh, guards held Jack in the dead center of Newgate Prison, where they could watch him at all times. Um, they also loaded him down with three hundred pounds of iron weights. What? <laughs> yeah, like just chain, <laughs> chain upon chain upon chain <laughs> upon chain <laughs> upon chain, <laughs> just to like be like, stay there, <laughs> sit there. Just think about what you've done. <laughs> or lift those weights and yeah. Yeah. become superhuman. If yeah. you're a man, yeah. if you're a man, you'll fucking break out of that and beat everybody up Yeah, on swing your way out. Swing around your head. You're, yeah, if, if you're a man, we're stuck in here with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of like Hannibal in Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Like, he's in the center of the, like, just yeah, they, they, all eyes on this guy. They're taking, they're taking Panopticon is what that's called. Taking kids on school trips to see him. High society visitors could pay a special four sh shillings to view uh, Jack in his cell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Royal artist jo uh, James Thornhill even painted a portrait. Uh, Defoe wrote, The concourse of people of tolerable fashion to see him was exceedingly great. He was always cheerful and pleasant to a degree, as turning almost everything as was said uh, onto a jest and banter. Um, the, prison, when the prison is like, let's, let's make money off yeah. this. Yeah. There we go. When he was visited by a man of the cloth, Reverend Wagstaff, he had this to say. Wagstaff, everybody's got these fucking names, dude. Yeah, man. How do you think he got that name? Uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh, uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, man, Reverend Wagstaff's coming to see me? Oh, not again. I know what he's got to show me. Skittles. Well, not half. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he said to the Reverend Wagstaff, quote, one file's worth... All the Bibles in the world. <laughs> Some high-ranking members of society even petitioned King George I to commute Shepard's sentence to transportation, send him to Australia or the colonies. On November 11th, the Daily Journal printed the following, quote, Yesterday morning, between 10 and 11, the notorious John Shepard was conveyed in a hackney coach from Newgate to Westminster. Shepard addressed himself to the bench, earnestly beseeching judges to intercede with his majesty for mercy. When he was asked how he came to repeat his crimes after his escapes, he pleaded youth and ignorance. <laughs> Dude, I'm young, dumb. I, I didn't I, even, I'm young, dumb with an abundance of cum. Yes. I didn't even know what I was doing. I had a wig on and I was on gin. Yeah. Oh I'm in a silk suit over here. I got a sword. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why your watch is in my hands. It's yeah. just here. I can't, I can't help myself. I love it. So among other things, he, he claimed that he had no opportunity to obtain um, his bread in an honest way. Well, he did quit the apprenticeship. Um, he also said he'd been fully determined to uh, leave England before he was retaken in Drury Lane. The judge, a Justice Prowess, said the only way he'd get any clemency would be if he named those who assisted him in his last prison escape. The devil? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah the devil himself. He's here. Um... Jack said that he'd already named his accomplices and they were all in custody or living abroad. The court reprimanded him for profaning the name of God in his statement. <laughs> uh, Prowess took into account the number of Jack's crimes and their heinousness and sentenced him to death, ordering his execution to be set. Their heinousness. For next Monday. Yeah, all nonviolent. Didn't and, kill, yeah, didn't. Yeah, you grab a wig? Who gives a fucking shit? You know, well, you grab a judge's wig. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a killing. Take a wig off a barrister. And mm, yeah. yeah. This other guy used to be twanging people with cudgels. And he runs the fucking shop. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't see fucking Jack hey, doing that. Jack's a good guy. Yeah. Love Jack. Ah, he just, you know, he takes watches and cuts he, holes. You steal and a couple of watches and some pen knives. Yeah. And you go to 
you go to the the gallows. Yeah, you wear a nice silk jacket and wig and fall asleep on the street because you're drunk on gin. Humans love stuff, mm. and if you take it, we kill you. It's <laughs> Jack told the court that if they put handcuffs on him, he could take them off right before their very eyes. Okay, they sh- did they? Please tell me. You might want to keep that to yourself. I don't know. Yeah. That's uh, thing you could steal. <laughs> The guards cuffed him anyway and remanded him back to Newgate through, uh, through a huge crowd outside, the largest ever seen at Westminster. One of the constables in attendance had his leg broken by the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and many other people were wounded in the commotion. Oh, my God. There he goes. Oh. <laughs> Is that him? He's on the roof. He took the handcuffs off, put him on a constable, and <laughs> yeah. pushed yeah. him into the crowd. That's him. Attack. On November 13th, the constables in Headboroughs of the Liberty of we- Westminster... Um, which are basically now police officers, received orders to be out and preserve the peace next Monday during Jack's hanging. The sheriffs ordered extra officers to guard Jack on the gallows at Tyburn. He'd be escorted while wearing handcuffs and leg irons. His execution was set for Monday, November 16th, 1724. He'd be escorted by the city marshal from the prison at Newgate to the gallows at Tyburn. As many as 200,000 people, around a third of London's population, came out to see Jack Hanged, and the gin sales were just and, off. And the at this charts. time, at this, at this, at, at this time too, like so, all those people that Jonathan Wilde was getting hanged, um, those those were like uh, holidays, and they always had uh, like you know a gallery. People would always come watch. It was right. real fucked up, savage shit. Yeah, no, yeah, no, they did. They, yeah, they, it was public entertainment back then. Yeah, the hangings. Yeah, but this is now like you know celebrities. Yeah, like this is like a T Swift level. Yeah. Hanging. Yeah. You know? It's a concert of the day. Yeah, I guess so, you know? Friendship bracelets. Yeah. Manacles, whatever you want to call yeah, them. Yeah, uh, Jack has one performance. <sighs> one so, night only. One night only. The marshal let Jack stop at the city of Oxford Tavern so he could drink a pint of sherry. A pint of sherry? Yes. Okay. It's a hell of a pint. Yeah. Reporters a mega just, pint. <laughs> yeah, mega pint. Um... Reporters described the, the procession through Shepherd's cart, with Shepherd's cart through the streets as joyous. There was a carnival-like atmosphere around Tyburn, where copies of Shepherd's official autobiography, Ghost Written by Defoe, were being sold. Wow! Um, yesterday morning at around nine, at, at about nine of the clock, the famous John Shepherd was carried up from condemned hold to the chapel in Newgate, where, having heard prayers and received the holy sacrament, he was brought down again to the press yard between 10 and 11 when Mr. Watson came in the name of the sheriffs to demand his body. Jack was... So that basically means he was taken to the condemned hold at Newgate and he attended a church before his hanging. Mr. Yeah. Watson told the prisoner that he must put him on a pair of handcuffs for his security. He vehemently resisted the same flying into the greatest passion and endeavored to beat the officers. Oh my God. Because <laughs> they're going to handcuff him? Yeah. Oh, well, Upon searching him, they found it. a penknife concealed about his clothes, <laughs> with which tis apprehended he designed to have cut the ropes and attempted to escape out of the car. Um, when he arrived at the tree, he sent for Mr. Appleby, a printer, into the cart, and the view of several thousands of people delivered to him a printed pamphlet entitled A Narrative of All the Robberies and Escapes of John Shepard, Give an Exact Description of His Robberies and Escapes, Together with the Wonderful Manner of His Escape from the Castle in Newgate, and of the Methods He Took Afterward for His Security. Oh, so much for brevity. Now, uh, so basically, he's pumping his book at his hanging. Yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Pretty nice. So, they, but you said they brought him to the tree. Yes. So they didn't have a, a apparatus gallows? built. They just or, had they, a, or was that the nickname for the gallows? Oh, that yeah, that's a good point. Um, I have to imagine there's not just a tree that they can fit. Four hundred thousand. Yes, I, I would assume it's gallows, Sorry, um, but I, 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 I am not entirely positive here. Let's see. Um, so his slight build had helped him escape from prison in the past, but it hurt him when it came time to getting a quick death. Uh, oh my boy. god! <laughs> yeah, because in a hanging, your you, weight. You, yeah, you, you're supposed to. Your neck is supposed to. Right, break. right. You're, you're not. You're not choking. Your neck is supposed to snap with the weight of your body. But, but I believe we did a Patreon. Uh, did we do was it a Patreon? Yeah, we talked about this a bit. Yeah, about the guy who invented 
quote, the, the humane way to hang. Yeah, the yeah. way it's supposed to go. And I don't think it had been, I can't remember if it hadn't been invented. Oh, yeah, yet. people used to just choke all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so And they didn't get it right for a very fucking long well, time. I, mean, I think that was also part of it. Like It was the, it was the, the big the drop. The torture was the part. Well, it's supposed to be entertainment, too. Yeah, watch them wriggle and... We had 200,000 people like don't want to do some strangulation. Yeah, you don't... <laughs> I think it was it was the big drop. The big drop is the longer yeah. the drop, the more the easier it, uh, it neck breaks. Yeah. And uh, the big issue is people not dropping them. Yeah, these are lynchings. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's <laughs> not hanging. So he's strangled by the rope for a full 15 minutes. <sighs> Boy. That uh, crowd needs that Which gym. is the time limit for hangings. At that point, uh-huh. the hangman cut, cut Jack's body down. Um, Union rules. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the rope only stays taut for 15 minutes or local 307 yep. is going to have me. No, I mean, this. So- I got to bring another guy in here. So Jack's friends in the crowd had planned to grab him and bring him to a doctor in hopes of reviving him. Um, but they were pre- prevented from doing so by the hanging crowd that pushed forward and kept anyone from taking the body out. The crowd were fearful that Jack's body would be stolen and taken for dissection. The particularly religious <laughs> believed that like- dismemberment could could prevent the resurrection of the body on Judgment Day. So his remains were badly damaged by the crushing crowd. Jesus but the, Christ. Were, but the authorities buried him in the churchyard in uh, St. Martin, St. Martin in the Fields that night. He was just 22 years old. Wow. A full life in 22 years. Yeah. I mean, not really. But uh, the crowd crushed him. And I do like the irony of people going like, you we you, you we can't let someone take him. Yeah, because they might uh, fuck up his resurrection. Yeah, but meanwhile, some of the people are like, he might not be dead. Really. Yeah, yeah, we right. could save him. We maybe. can res- we can re- we can rebuild him. We can, we can resurrect him now. Nobody touch him. <laughs> he might not get to heaven. <laughs> yeah. I, th- yeah. I, w- I was thinking that they would cut him up as um, to keep keepsakes like as a martyr. Well, I think right, there was, there was yeah. probably that much panic that. Was, yeah, it was. There was probably a lot of people baying for different things. Yeah. Um. I got his foreskin. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I ate it. Oh, oh shit. shit. Um. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> it grew back. Yeah. Like that, that, that nun. <laughs> yeah. I, I took the sacrament of the Lord's foreskin, and it was good. Mm. Yeah. And it was so that it was like calamari. <laughs> They're sneaking that into the calamari now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Foreskin. Yeah. But I'm I'm cool with that. I'd prefer it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know where foreskin's been. I don't know where calamari's <laughs> from. Yeah. yeah. The ocean? Gross. Yeah. Calam. Come on. But Foreskin's in a guy's pants. <laughs> Forget about it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Only thing, you know, pig's butthole is a good runner-up. If you're in a pinch, you can't get a foreskin. Yeah, sure. sure. But, you know, I got preferences. So as soon as writers heard Jack was buried, they were creating pamphlets, broadsheets, and ballads devoted to his incredible life with some added fictional flourishes. The uh, weekly journal or, uh, or Saturday Post reported on December 5th, on Saturday last at the theater in Drury Lane was a new entertainment called Harlequin Shepherd. A London preacher tried to hold his congregation's attention by referring to Jack's escapes in his sermons. <laughs> Let me exhort you then to open the locks of your hearts with the nail of repentance Burst asunder oh the fetters of your beloved lusts. Mount the chimney of hope. <laughs> Take from thence the bar of good re- resolution and break through the stone wall of despair. Pop culture yeah, sermons. That's, yeah, that's a good it's one. It's like if you go to a mega church now and they talk yeah. about like Iron Man sacrifice. Yeah, <laughs> or the or the or the priest is rapping. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know Jesus. And yeah, that's what I say. <laughs> yeah. I read the Bible. I'm a disciple. Yeah. <laughs> On December 4th, the British Journal published an imagined dialogue between Julius Caesar and Jack Shepard. <laughs> oh, okay. Jack favorably compared his ex- How did that go? In Latin and English? How'd they um, <laughs> the only word they know is posse. Yeah. yeah. Jack favorably compared his exploits and values to Caesar's. By December 10th, Edward's Beth, Bess, who'd been serving uh, a term for helping Jack escape from prison, was released herself. Meanwhile, Jonathan Wilde's throat slashing and his inability to control Jack Shepard had drained him considerably. The public had turned against the thief takers in defense of, with the thieves. Wilde had loosened his grip on his criminal gang while he recuperated from his injuries. His gang grew to despise him further in his absence. <laughs> um, so he recovered fully or did he have like uh, 
was able to not able to speak or, or how 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 did he yeah, use that little voice thing? Yeah, do you have a little my dog like this? <laughs> yeah, I think. But I... except it's like a little trumpet. That <laughs> yeah, <he's> like... <laughs> a throat slashing is pretty. R- 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 yeah, down on the windpipe. <laughs> yeah, or maybe um, just so maybe just cut down to the windpipe. It didn't. Yeah, actually. he's got that in, inglorious bastard scar. Yeah. So yeah, this is kind of the thing is that like um, a big deal why. Jack wouldn't go with Wild was uh, he was of that younger generation that was from uh, that economic bubble bursting when they like just didn't author- authority figures were just not to be trusted. Right. So so this guy is, you know, he's the cop and he's the capo. It's yeah. like, you know, what he's I mean? a double authority figure. Yeah. Yeah. So he was both good and bad. So that's why he was never down with it. And by this time, you know, think about, you know, the concert this guy just had at his hanging. You can clearly tell the people are with the thieves and not with the thief takers. Yeah. So, you know, he just uh, kind of dwindled from popularity when before he had been incredibly popular. Um, Next generation. Difficult. So he loosened his grip on his criminal gang while he recuperated from his injuries. His gang grew to despise him further. Once he recovered, he used violent tactics to break one of his gang members out of jail. The authorities were then searching for a while, then he had to hide out for a few weeks. When he thought the whole business had blown over, he tried to return to his former activities. On February 15th, Wilde and his man, Quilt Arnold, <laughs> were both arrested for the violent jailbreak. <laughs> Wilde was held in Newgate, and he tried to keep his business going from his cell. Evidence was pre- presented against him for the jailbreak and having stolen jewels during the previous August installation of the Knights of the Garter, which is like a, you know, order of knights. Um, knights of the Garter. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Five days later, on February 20th, at about five in the evening, the well-known Mr. Jonathan Wilde was carried before Sir John Fryer, who refused his petition for bail. Some in the public were apprehensive about the loss of Wilde's intelligence and protection as a crime fighter. An estimated 120 men were sent to the gallows based on Wilde's capture or his leaks to the authorities. Jesus Christ. They build trees because of me. Yeah. <laughs> the Daily Journal reported on April 3rd, 1725, that Edgeworth Best was committed to a Tothill Fields bridal prison for seducing a shopkeeper's son to go thieving with her. That is the last any newspaper makes any mention of Best. That shouldn't be a crime. Seducing someone? Yeah, what? Good pussy? Yeah. Pussy posse? Yeah. yeah. He's like, oh, I'm going to steal all kinds of stuff now. And it's like, oh, it, how's that her fault? She liberated him. Yeah. yeah. Thou art accused of good pussy? <laughs> How do you plead? <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> no <Ooh>. contest. <laughs> um, at the time of Wilde's trials, a high-ranking member of the government, the Lord Chancellor, Lord Thomas Parker, the first... Earl of Macclesfield, was being tried uh, for taking 100,000 pounds in bribes. The public were clamoring for an end to corruption and for corrupt officials to receive the maximum punishments. Members of Wilde's gang sensed that he was not going to wriggle out of this one, and they decided they better come forward. They turned in evidence against Wilde until the courts knew the full magnitude of his criminal empire that had been running for 15 years. Additional evidence pointed to Wilde as having frequently bribed public officials. Wilde went through a final trial at the Old Bailey on May 15th. Ultimately, he faced two indictments for stealing 50 yards of lace from Ka- Catherine Statham on January 22nd. <laughs> uh, that was his buddy Quill. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 50 yards of lace? He, like, walks into, like, a fabric shop, and he's like, ah, fuck that, it. That is like getting Capone on tax <laughs> evasion. Yeah. They got this guy for yeah. stealing lace. Some yeah. kinky bullshit. <laughs> for your dress. Um... Satham was a late sailor who, uh, who'd visited Wilde in prison. Wilde was acquitted on one charge, but he, he was convicted on the second charge because of evidence Statham offered against him. The judge sentenced him to hang. A petrified Wilde asked for a reprieve, but he was denied. In his cell, awaiting death, he suffered from gout and insanity. What? <laughs> he suffered from insanity. He, uh, he caught gout. <laughs> and then insanity? Or So do you know what gout is? Yeah. Well... Tell people. Uh, gout is uh, often called the uh, the the rich a rich person's disease. Mm-hmm. Um, it's from eating decadent foods high in I think uh, some maybe maybe sodium or something. And you, your your legs and feet swell up. Yeah, it's it starts very painful. Starts in the big toe. Yeah, and it um it, it's very very painful. So yeah, it's very painful. It's a form of arthritis uh, when the body has extra uric acid uric and. Acid. Um, Sharp crystals form in the joints. Oh, that's not yeah, good. But- Uric acid. Now that's almost piss. Now what's laudanum? Laudanum mm. is uh, an opioid, uh, an opiate actually, probably yeah, a drink. It's uh, basically a heroin mm-hmm. in a drink 
form. Yeah, and uh, and it's nice. Yeah, but also that the reference that is 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 of that time and uh, yeah, it, was it, bit, it, dis- it disappeared. When did that? Yeah, well, well then it was, it was heroin. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was very yeah. much like a Wild West thing. You yeah, know? they're yeah. all yeah. They drink it in uh, that Deadwood. Old, Deadwood and yeah, uh, uh, right. the the that Johnny Depp movie uh, about Alan that Alan Moore movie. Uh, Dead man? No. From uh, hell. From hell. He's yeah. you know, he's a laudanum addict. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, he's uh, insane with gout, and um, he can't go to church or eat any meals. Um, but he can have laudanum. So, he uh, on the morning of his execution, he drinks a large dose of laudanum. An abundance. <laughs> An abundance. Hoping to die in a less painful fashion on his own terms. He was extremely weak from not having eaten recently, and the laudanum caused him to vomit quite violently until oh. he fell into a coma. Fuck. Um, he was barely conscious when jailers escorted him to the gallows. <laughs> oh my god! This guy's in the cr- <laughs> Weekend and Bernie's them the to the gallows. Ah! Oh, he's Daniel, 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 Daniel Defoe said the audience for Wilds Hanging was the largest there had ever been before, and that there wasn't any celebration for the condemned and no commiseration. Yeah, he didn't make a lot of friends. Well, and also once all the shit came out, it was like, you know, everybody that thought. Oh, he keeps us safe. Knows it's all bullshit. Yeah, you know. So the jig jig is up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you also find out like he just literally sold men to their deaths for money. Yeah, which is not this summer's hottest look. And then on the day of his hanging, he doesn't even seem to care at all. He's not. In advance of Wilds hanging, many tickets were sold for the best viewing positions, <laughs> prime seating. <laughs> but there were many popular hangings in 1725. But Wilds drew an especially vast and boisterous crowd. William Sperry and Robert Sanford and Robert Harpham. <laughs> were also condemned to die with Wild. He was the last to be hanged of all the prisoners. A headliner. Yeah. 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 And the operation went off without a hitch. Richard Arnett, the hangman, had even... And now for you, you're all... We all know who you're here to see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Comes out all laudanumed out. Yeah, ah. he's, just, well, he's in a coma. They had to drag him out there. Uh, Richard Arnett, who was the hangman that day, had even been a guest at Wild's wedding. <laughs> this is awkward. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you and I go back a little bit hmm. Till death do us part, right? <laughs> Under the cover of night, Wilde's body was buried in secret In the St. Pancras Church, uh, old churchyard Next to his third wife, Elizabeth Mann And one of his lovers who had died in 1718 According to Wilde's witches Wishes <laughs> according, to, uh, according to his witches The witches yeah. The burial was not to be permanent In the 1700s, <laughs> medical schools were performing autopsies And dissections of some of Brim- Britain's most famous criminals so Wilde's body was exhumed and sold for dissection to the Royal College of Surgeons. <laughs> this guy's toe's this fucking big. <laughs> you got to see this toe. Yeah. Uh, the Royal College's Hunterian Museum still displays his skeletal remains. Are they different? They're really unique? Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> just old. Yeah. Old bones. Yeah. No, it's not like a weird skull shape. Mm, no. <laughs> nope. Today, Wilde is famous for how satirists have made use of his story. At the time of his hanging, the newspapers were filled with stories about Wilde's life, collections of his quotes, and farewell speeches. Def- uh, Defoe wrote a narrative about Wilde for Applebee's Journal in May, the true and genuine account of the life and actions of the late Jonathan Wilde. It was published in June 1725. Uh, it claimed to have excerpts from Wilde's diaries. Uh, there was a play by a man named John Gay, The Beggar's Opera, first performed in 1728, and it was one of the most famous fictional depictions of Jack Shepard's life. Jack inspired the protagonist, Captain... McKeith and McKeith Semison's Peachin was based on Jonathan Wild. The play actually earned back all the money that uh, he had lost in the South Sea bubble. John Gay. Huh. Oh, good for him. The Beggar's Opera went on to be produced quite regularly for over 100 years. In 1928, uh, Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weil unveiled their contemporary take on The oh. Beggar's Opera, which they called the Three Penny Opera. Oh, fuck me. Well, one penny yeah. gets you drunk. That's right. And two pennies mm-hmm. gets you... Three gets you a play. Gets you to sleep. <laughs> the Jack Shepard character in that opera is also the hero of the song Mac the Knife by Bobby Darren. Oh, I know that song. Yeah. yeah. It, that, 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 et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jack Shepard reappeared in pop culture around 1840 in the novel Jack Shepard by William Ainsworth. The popularity of his tale and the fear that others would be drawn to emulate his behavior caused the authorities to refuse to license any plays <laughs> in London with Jack Shepard in the title for 40 years. Jesus. Jesus. Fuck. The government's fear of young men emulating Jack Shepard may not be entirely unfounded. A valet named Francois Benjamin Covissier confessed that a book about Shepard had inspired him to murder his master, Lord William Russell, 
on May 5th, 1840. I failed to see the problem it, I here. Don't, well, I also don't see Shepard having murdered anybody. Right. I mean, if he... That's right, yeah. If, so. he, if he burgled his master's tools, I would see mm. that there was some connection there, but... Yeah, no, I had a bad Tuesday, and I fucking... I, I killed a couple of people. The outlaws, Band Frank them. and Jesse James, signed their letters to the Kansas City Star as Jack Shepard. No shit. Yes. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle has Sherlock Holmes refer to the Professor Moriarty as a latter-day Jonathan Wilde in the novel The Valley of Fear. Quote, everything comes in circles, even Professor Moriarty. Jonathan Wilde was the hidden force of the London criminals to whom he had sold his brains and his organization on a 15% commission. Huh. The old wheel turns and the same spoke comes up. 19th century Scottish journalist Charles McKay offers his opinion on the Jack Shepard phenomenon in his book Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions <laughs> and the Madness of Crowds. Okay, that's a, we got to find that book. That's great, a, great title. Mm-hmm. Um, quote, whether it be that the multitude, feeling the pangs of poverty, sympathize with the daring and ingenious depredators who d- take away the rich man's superfluity, or whether it be the interest that mankind in general feel for the records of the perilous adventure, it is certain that the populace of all countries look with admiration upon great and successful thieves. That's a good one. That's the story of fucking Jack Shepard and Jonathan Wild, friends. Wow. You know, um... <laughs> Yeah, the, the, uh, yeah, the I don't know if my dad probably said this, but, you know, the difference between cops and criminals is just their outfits, right? Right. People, yeah. They're just, they just, they're, they're both gangs, and mm-hmm. one is just state sanctioned. They have a badge. Mm-hmm. They draw from the same lot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The departed. No. But well, we know that in LA, we have the, some of the gangs are also cops. Yeah. yeah. Like, literally. They have gangs in, in the sheriff's department yeah. here, right? So, yeah. And the whole thing from the get go, like, you know, because, like, when I was coming, you know, Laura was talking about this, I was like, all right, well, you know, why, why a police force ever, right? Which is, this is the beginning of. Right. And it's funny that, yeah, the first place it goes is just every, like, just fucking over poor people because there's a thing where it's like, um, you know, the law knows these things are going to go on anyway. So the only thing you can do is try to make a little money out of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's the same whether it's like Serpico or this. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, don't wa- you don't want to be too good at your job. Right. If you're, uh, you know, a rat catcher, <laughs> you're going to leave a couple of rats. Right. To, there won't to, be anything else. Yeah. There will be yeah. no rats to kill. So yeah. you got to leave a couple of breeding pairs to keep business going but he did i mean wild did have a thing with um the highwaymen of the day and uh a lot of the gangs like that carrot gang (laughs) um he did stomp them out but the thing is is that like he still had his own highwaymen right yeah so it's not like he stomped them out so no one would get robbed in that area no but but he did get rob people but he did get like the the love for it in the media well yes well sure sure but that they were they were like this fucking guy knows what's up yeah he's because he's one of them yeah um yeah he's he's our guy yeah and as long as you're part of the system you can do that i mean in america the cops started as slave catchers yeah Yes, yes. Which Got is, that. you know, you step even further. From, oh, right. They're not just poor people. <sighs> they're like, not people. Yeah. Technically. Yeah. But like, I, I, it's so, how easily he just fit in and they're like, as long as you keep turning over people, mm-hmm. no one's going to ask any questions. And here's a bunch of money for it. Yeah. Yeah, well, and we need somebody who can think like a criminal. Right. Mm-hmm. right. So, I mean, there is a logic to it. You know, you want... It, like the government hires hackers to work right. for, you know, right. cyber security. After they catch him, yeah. Yeah. And this thing with Jack Shepard, it was just a thing where by then he had already built such a reputation uh, wild for stomping out, you know, like these gangs and highwaymen that were not under his control that Jack Shepard just existed as a challenge to his authority. And that's why it was like, I got to fucking, even though he's not doing anything yeah. that bad. Yeah. Um. It was just like, I got to fucking get this guy. And then when it was like, oh, he's really good. He's fucking getting out of prison. He's like, all right, just work for me, man. Come on. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. And then he's still like, nah, man, fuck well, you. I'm hanging out with Olive and uh, Baguette. And-, and so that's kind of like the thing, too, is like, you know, the public, if you're thinking about the public in that time in London, and they're going like, you got out. And like, he would leave town. He still would come back. And it was just because I think he loved... You know, just kind of shoving it in their faces a little bit. Yeah, and that's where the action is. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, for him, the action is the Jews. That's right. Yeah. And it's a city, I guess, where you could get lost more. You know, if you're doing, you're not going to. You're not doing that up in fucking, you know, Wolverhampton or whatever, yeah, you know? 12 people. You're going to find yeah, you in no. like three seconds. Yeah, I mean, Bolton's just, there's nothing happening there. Yeah. I don't even have a disco. Yeah, um, I, I, I really love the story. I think it's really poignant and beautiful. Um, you know, just uh, this kind of, you know, harmless guy taking down this, this big Capone type, you know, and the public just kind of falling in love with him um, and, and loving uh, that, you know, he's, you know, Multiple times breaking his girlfriend out of prison. You yeah. Know? Um, I don't know wh- why he turned against her in the in, if that was just for sympathy in the papers. You know, blame the woman mm-hmm. or something. It's uh, easy. It's a tale as old as time. Or the, or, <laughs> or they just legitimately had a falling out, or maybe she sold him out in some way. I don't know. Um, but I love that. Still to the end, he fucking still has like a knife to cut the rope, yeah. and like he's I got a plan. He's yeah, still yeah. like fuck, and yeah, thing. he's still trying to be like, fuck you guys, ah! <laughs> and then he be, even has his friends hanging out, going like, we got to get to the body first. We're gonna catch him. Yeah. We're gonna catch him when he falls. Like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna flatline him. <laughs> he's gonna come back and tell. Us yeah, he's the that's the tree they're talking about. <laughs> Flatliner. Ah, <laughs> uh, Kiefer and fucking. Julia Demi Roberts. Moore or whatever. It was Julia Roberts, yeah. All standing by. Um, Flatliners. <laughs> nice. I think it was remade, too. It was, and nobody saw nobody it. Nobody saw and it. Nor should they. No. <laughs> no. See the original. That's a good it's movie. It's tight. Yeah. tight. Um, yeah uh, Great story. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's really fascinating. It's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's wild. Um, it would, mm-hmm. it, and Shepard. And, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, and this way that, like, Policing was just kind of late in the game for a city like London is kind of nuts. And this idea, too, that it's like <laughs> the fucking king doesn't give a shit. He's just like, I don't know fucking what these animals are doing. He's like, you're all supposed to be defending me. <laughs> Everybody's a cop. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's like they're all starving and fucking drinking the shitty gin. Oh, please. <laughs> That's how they kept the peace. Yeah. Everybody wasted. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, France cuts them off from all the brandy. No, France didn't cut them off. They were just being proud. Oh, okay. They chose. They were that. also being proud about having a police force to France too. Right. Everything uh, is about them, right. like having this huge. Like, Isn't this cool? Uh, you we know, have cops now. <laughs> Isn't that cool? It's just like it's such a huge inferiority complex to France for like so much of British history. Yeah, they can't get over it. Well, they. I mean, but they. They. have it reminds me they made that mistake years and years later of paying someone to to just keep handing over over things. It was in uh, when India, it was uh, I forget what the animal was that was fucking up their crops or something. Yeah, and so they paid people in India to give them um, the corpses of them, and oh, so people started breeding them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my god. It, it, it's not the snake and the mongoose, but it's something like that. Yeah. They just started breeding the thing. Yeah, and then you can make a ton of money selling. Dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I it's got a snake, man. It's yeah. the same thing as this guy going like, well, I'm a criminal. I'll make more criminals and then just give you a bunch of them. And then I make money. Well, yeah. And, I mean, there was a lot of, like, thing of, like, I know the guy for the job, you know, to find my stolen shit. It's this guy. Going there before it's even reported. Just because you know he's got his ear to the ground, yeah. and he's like, "Oh, dude, I got your shit. Don't even trip. Mm-hmm. Here's just give me a little bit of money. It's over. You're like, it's all good. You know, thief gets paid. He gets paid. They get their shit back. Everybody feels good. Mm-hmm. Everybody feels like Jack. everybody. <laughs> well, I mean, he, he he's got his shit back, so he feels know, good about he, that. That's not a good time. No, but it's better than it being completely gone. I yeah, guess. yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, it's. It's, I, a, it's a having stuff tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, like yeah. you're talking about with the, you know. With, stuff with the, is tight. The economy, Stuff is tight. The but economy also changing. They got buckles now. They got, yeah. they got buttons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. button former. Quilt. <laughs> button yeah. molder. I mean, people named Quilt. People named Quilt. That's how many people named Maggots. That's yeah. Right. Paul Maggot. Out here shaking it. Oh, <laughs> Paul, Ma- uh, Paul, Paul Maggot. Paul Maggot. You can call yourself anything. <laughs> yeah. It's got to be better than that. Ugh. <laughs> <sighs> What? Don't think about it like that. It's, it's just a just, name. Yeah, but probably a lovely woman. I I bet she's the loveliest woman. Yeah, she's got mm-hmm. both ears. Oh yeah, <laughs> maybe even the third one. Who knows? Yeah, third ear. I don't know. Maybe she's blessed. Okay. 
Yeah. Keep that in mind. Paul Maggot. That's it, fellas. Let's say um I got Wild and Shepherd. Yeah. Yeah. Very um very fun. Fascinating. Fascinating. It's I, like, yeah. I lo- I love the there's a there's a great dynamic of the criminal has to fight off of the bigger criminal who's legitimate. Right. Yeah. And that guy Shepherd is just doing dumb shit. Mm-hmm. He's stealing wigs and just <laughs> fancy. <laughs> Making me look bad. <laughs> yeah. Like it's like it's just a thing where he's like, you know what I want to do is just go out with two girls and get really fucking south. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And it's that all the time. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll have some pictures on the YouTube. You can see some some uh, draw or some the uh, the uh, the portrait they made in in prison of uh, of Shepherd. And um, that's all I got, fellas. All right. Should we wrap it? Let's wrap it up. Great story. Okay, I'm going to say goodnight, all of you. My name is John Fahey. I'm Aaron Pita. Good night, everybody. We love you. Good night.